Greetings, building science enthusiasts, and welcome back to the Building Science Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by April Air, the trusted leader in indoor air quality solutions. Through their understanding of consumer needs for indoor air quality and HVAC channel expertise, they help home builders leverage the full value and benefits of healthy home solutions. April Air products allow builders not just to meet, but stay ahead of changing codes for fresh air ventilation with a full line of efficient supply ventilation products. We've incorporated April Air products into our designs for years because they provide real value for engineered systems. For their full product line, check out aprilair.com backslash BSP. That's air with an E. The first step towards a healthier home is at aprilair.com backslash BSP. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the rest of the episode. Welcome to this. Okay. Oh, welcome to the Building Science. To the Building Science Podcast. 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 Welcome to the Building Science Podcast. Bringing the human factor to architecture and design. Brought to you by Positive Energy in Austin, Texas. Okay, hello and welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to the Building Science Podcast. I'm Christoph Irwin here, as always, or as usual, with my trusty sidekick, Miguel. Hey, everybody. Nothing more profound to add? Life's a big old thing. (laughs) I'm also here with a good friend and colleague, Joe Basham, with Allensworth & Porter Law. Would you like to say hello? Hi. Happy to be here. Okay, I'll do a little more introduction shortly or give you the opportunity. So quick, some introductory remarks here on the Building Science Podcast. This is about building science, although it might not seem like it today. And here's the connection, right? So building science provides the critical and often missing systems view. So there you go, systems view at the intersection of architecture, engineering, and let's keep in mind engineering is applied physics, chemistry, biology, geology, things like that and construction, so architecture, engineering, and construction. And then the other piece that comes in, so the systems view is the first piece, the second piece is that we know, those of us in the industry, we know that technology is not the constraint to fantastic outcomes. Technology is not the constraint to the application of building science principles to the built world. So, you know, we could have fantastic buildings where fantastic would be durable, comfortable, efficient, healthy, you know, resilient, all these things. But we don't. We don't get it. And the reason we don't get it, in my and many people's opinions, is that there is a system of systems associated with the application of building science principles that is not optimized. And uh, just as the building enclosure controls heat flow, and mass flow, you know, and moisture flow through a building assembly. There are contractual agreements that control the flow of accountability, liability, risk, money, (laughs) power through this um, system of systems that is you guys listening, the people and the relationships between people involved in this. So into this complex Um, chaotic, probably emotionally charged, we'll hear from you soon on that, world, we have these brave men and women that wade into that and they try to define with with precision and clarity these relationships between people. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And um, hopefully we'll be providing some insights to you guys that'll help you uh, have a better life. So Joe, I know you work at Allensworth & Porter Law Firm. Could you tell me your role here? And yeah, something about I'm it. the managing partner here. We're a small construction law firm. I said we're small, about 10, which is hmm. pretty good size for a town of this size, maybe the largest construction-specific law firm in town. I've got a degree in construction science from Texas A&M, and that's pretty much all I've done. Let's say that again, degree in construction science, yeah. Yeah. Wait, wait, and you must have got a law degree somewhere, too. And I did. I got <laughs> a law degree as well to go along with that. But we're all construction all the time. And as you know, in this town, that's a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot of cranes around here. Looking out the window at several projects we're working on right now. Uh, Well, we can maybe hear more about that. Let's hear a little bit about that now. Like several projects you're working on right now, does that mean there's some liability claim happening or conflict occurring? So the life cycle typically of the lawyer is sometimes at the very beginning getting involved to help the parties put together the contract, which is sort of 
getting everybody on the same page, hopefully. And mm-hmm. then the project kicks off, and we often help with the day-to-day stuff that comes up. Not day-to-day, I wouldn't say day-to-day, but week by week, things come up. And so you, a lot of times owners will call and say, hey, what about this? What do we need to do in this situation? Or what's the best way to document this? Or the contractors asked us for that. What do you mm-hmm. think we ought to mm-hmm. do? That's just normal, I call it project management type stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, towards the end of the job, things can sometimes get even hairier. Um, as, as you get towards the end, sometimes things get compressed. Schedules get compressed. Owners' expectations for a project being delivered get compressed. Money gets compressed. And all Human this, emotions get compressed. <laughs> people start getting um, a little nervous. Yeah. And when people get nervous, they start getting you know antsy and so so there can be some disputes we call those typically close out as things get resolved through the project close out who you're gonna how you're gonna pay your subs and what's wrong with this when you're gonna do your warranty punch things like that and then at the end uh sort of the last phase of it is is full-blown disputes and those disputes can take the form of um, an informal settlement through a mediation or they can if they don't settle at a mediation or informally then the parties have Traditionally, either selected litigation or arbitration is the way they want their disputes resolved, and we'll take those disputes through arbitration or litigation, hmm. and hopefully that ends it. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes we take them up on appeal. Hmm. It's a very long life cycle of a case uh, of a project. If you've helped put together a project, the project had a dispute. The dispute couldn't be resolved informally. It couldn't be resolved in mediation. You had a lawsuit. Lawsuit didn't take care of it. Now you're on appeal. Some of those things can last, you know, ten to fifteen years after the project. They just oh my go goodness! On. If it's possible to answer this, how many? Like, let's say you have ten projects. Is it one of them might go to arbitration litigation? Is it two of them? Is it? Um, we typically say that less than one percent of all disputes will end up in a full blown, a formal dispute resolution process. Okay. Right. The. Back in the day, there was only one way of resolving disputes, and that was by going to trial. Mm -hmm. Um, For a long time now, people have had private resolution, which is arbitration. Um, And arbitration is usually final. Once it's over and done with, there's no appeal. That's changing a little bit now. People want to have the ability to appeal in arbitration. Interesting. Because that's that's a person, not a judge, usually a construction lawyer or something like that. who's rendering a final decision, and some sometimes those decisions are just not exactly right, hmm. and some parties want to have the ability to have a second look. But traditionally, it's been final. You just need the dis- dispute to be over. They, they render a decision, and that's the end of it. All right, that's good. So uh, that's a great introduction to the topic. I want to take you back. You talked about that it that things start at the contract phase, um, and the goal uh, of, of the contract is to mitigate risk. Right. So can you talk about that? The beginning phase of a project. Yeah, usually, actually, the beginning phase of of, of of a project and the risk management or mitigation actually begins before the contract, and it begins with uh, client selection. And there's a mm-hmm. number of uh, like insurance companies and others that study the amount of claims that come out of construction projects have all have all attributed a significant amount on client selection. Really, um, and that's never been more important than it is right now because we're super busy. And when the market is white hot like it is right now, it's very tempting to take work that comes in the door. And owners are are trying to do a lot of work. They've got money available and they want to put that money to work. But we've been saying in this town for a long time that there's been a, a labor shortage. Mm-hmm. That labor shortage has been shorthand, uh, a shorthand way of referring to subcontractors, traditionally tradesmen. Mm-hmm. But over the last three years or so, maybe longer, that labor shortage really has expanded from, every, from the subcontractor level through every level. And in my opinion, there's a labor shortage at the owner level. There's a labor shortage at the lender level. There's a labor shortage at the design professional level, the contractor level, and in fact at the lawyer level. Huh. There's a labor shortage just everywhere, and this town is 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 very tight. So, what that means is that you have to be very careful about taking on projects. Um, not the first thing is is really 
selecting the right client, mm-hmm. selecting the right project, um, because everybody um, has got a war story about taking on a project that you know they knew in their heart or in their gut at the time they should, probably should have passed on, but yeah, they did. Yeah, but things were so busy and chaotic, and they here's a client. The work, there's them always in. a reason. There's something. There's yeah, always something, uh, and you took it on. Um, just passing on clients that, that, that just don't feel right or that you don't have a long history with or maybe just seems a little too far out there can usually save you um, in the long run. A stitch in, a stitch in time saves <laughs> none, right? Yeah. So the client selection part is, is very important. It's easier to go forward in a relationship than backward, too. Right. I help a lot of people get out of messy deals. And mm. those would be a lot easier to get out of if you never got into them in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> right? That just, it happens. And, and look, sometimes things change. People change. Uh, you may be in a project with certain individuals, and, 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 uh, and in this market, people are changing jobs all the time. So you may have gotten in bed with somebody to do a project, and that person turns out to be taking a job somewhere else. And the next thing you know, you're working for somebody that you've never met. Wow. So that can change the risk profile of that project yeah. because you don't have a relationship with them and they weren't part of the decisions that were made up until the time they got there. So sometimes there's some second guessing. How did we get here and who made this decision and the person you're now dealing with wasn't at the table at the time? So all of those things can, they don't guarantee problems, but they're just indicators of things that could go wrong later on. So you, you, you're saying client selection in hot markets is challenging. Is, are there any tips on how to select a good client? Or? Well, I think it's important. The firm, the partners at the firm here have spent a fair amount of time in the last year or so, several months, hmm. trying to focus on um, where our bullseye is, right? Trying to stay focused because it's very easy in this market to get distracted. Yeah and start chasing other things that sound interesting or exciting. And it's important to stay disciplined and yeah. focused. And I think that's the key to the client selection is you always, you're always you going to want, ideally, to have projects with people that you have a relationship with. But it, you can't keep doing the same project with the same people over and over again. Inver- invariably, there's going to be other people come along. So I think it's important to stay with your core focus. And if it doesn't fit within your core focus... I wouldn't say that you shouldn't do it or can't do it, but I think you need to start thinking very hard about why you're doing it, the risks that you may be taking, and who's going to ultimately be responsible or accountable for making sure that project that's not directly in your wheelhouse, yeah. uh, why, why you're doing that. And that'll apply at all levels. So if you're a GC and you do mostly multifamily, don't do an institutional. And if you're a HVAC installer, contractor, and you do chillers, don't go into VRF. Or if you do, be thoughtful and judicious. That's know? right. And yeah. it happens every day. Um, mm-hmm. You know, as a matter of fact, right now, um, one of the things that we deal with a lot is subcontractors that are going broke. Ooh. And a lot of people ask, how can, how can you go broke in this market? Yeah. Um, but it happens all the time. And they're they're, they drop like flies in a market like this. This is a very long market, as many people know. This has been going on a long time, and a lot of people have been calling for its correction for some time. Um, I'm not a market prognosticator, so I don't know. But I can tell you that the longer a market goes like this, the more likely it is that people will start dropping out. And subcontractors who have a very difficult time getting labor, and they have a very difficult time predicting what the cost of that labor is going to be on a project that's a going to start a year from now Mm -hmm. can get themselves into trouble because they've taken on a lot more work than they can actually handle yeah and when that happens you know owners start supplementing your work and then you're not getting paid and all of a sudden you don't have cash flow yeah yeah we just interviewed trevor brown a couple weeks ago and who you know and he just talked about uh, he tries hard to walk around the job site and meet people and he'll say so how long you been doing building and closure detailing two weeks you know, what were you doing before this? It could have been working at a gas station or something. It's yeah, they get poached all the time. I have a client who um, is so mad at, at headhunters and recruiters, he wants to, he called to find out if he could sue them. <laughs> they keep taking his workers, and they, they've been there a long time, and they've been trained up, and out the door they go. It's yeah. just, it's endemic to the market right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. and within a subcontractor pool, the, 
the top guys in a hot market will go out on their own. Correct. Right. Yeah. 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 yeah that's very true. So what about in a market that's not constrained, like Austin, because I'm sure there are plenty of listeners who are experiencing that. What are so yes, the other side of the a coin colder market? market. Well, I always look at everything as a as sort of a spectrum, right? So. Um, we're at one end of the spectrum, at the high end of the spectrum, and you can be in a very slow market. And people listening obviously have been in a situation where the market was, we were in a recession or a depression, and things were slow. Yeah. People go broke there too. What you're looking for is Goldilocks. Mm-hmm. What you want is the middle, the nice, not too hot, not too cold, mm-hmm. just right. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm sure that there are places in the country right now that don't have enough work. It's not white hot, and it's not even Goldilocks. It's just slow. Um, and I can remember those days very well here. There were a number of my clients who could continue to get work, but they took that work uh, just to cover overhead. They weren't making any money, but they weren't losing money either, so they were keeping their employees, they were paying the bills, um, keeping insurance up and things yeah. like that. That went on for, for several years. Um, it was actually a very interesting time when people started getting more uh, work trying to increase their profit margin. Um, that was hard because you still had other people who were willing to take that work at zero fee, essentially. Oof. And so you're competing with people at different sort of eco- economic mm-hmm. indicators or desires or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it's what I tell people is you don't want to be on either, either end of the spectrum. You want to try to be in the middle. And um, in Austin, we just so happen to be at one end of the spectrum. And, and in other places in the country, I'm sure just... There's probably a nice equilibrium, and mm-hmm. they have plenty of work for the amount of people they can retain. Um, I mean, for instance, I was just in, in West Texas, in Midland, uh, yesterday, which is where I'm from, um, and the oil and gas business is booming, and you can't get, they can't get people to do anything. They're, they have such, I mean, I think unemployment in Midland is less than 2%, mm-hmm. which is to say virtually zero, because there's always going to be some amount of unemployment. So um, I have a client who can't get IT work. He can't get people. There's just such a demand for people to do things, and everybody is, has been gobbled up by oil and gas, and they're out working. So wow. that happens. And But to your point, the client selection business on, on these projects, you end up getting people who are inexperienced, yeah. um, and uh, it can create problems. All right. So, what comes after client selection? Is that where contracts become? Let's say, let's say you've been cogent and careful, and you got a client now. Yeah. And Usually, and that the, the the nice part about that is I have nothing. I can't. All I can do is tell people about client selection. I, I'm not typically mm-hmm. involved in client selection. But wait, actually, real quick, you said it was a significant percentage of projects go bad because of client selection. Is there an, is there a number? Is it like five percent significant? Is I think it's higher than that. Um, some some people that have looked at these numbers, and again, this would probably be for design professionals. It's a number crunched by insurance companies providing insurance for design professionals. So okay. it may be slightly skewed in that regard, but mm-hmm. I would think it's probably pretty much what the market looks like. Um, they pegged this. This was years ago, so it's not this is not current data, but they pegged client selection at 16% of the total number of claims. Wow. So, so almost a fifth. wrong right at the beginning. Yeah, almost a fifth. And, I, you know, I have clients. I've been in a situation where I've had clients, defended clients, who've made a poor client selection decision. And there's limits to what you can do at that point. You do the best you can with what you've got. Start working on the contract. Start working on your defenses. But ultimately, that problem would have been headed off by not taking that client on in the first place. Yeah. So. And after that? After that, once you do have a, you have been selected or you've selected a client, um, then I think it's important to focus on the contract. And I talk a lot about contracts with folks around town, and um, there's always a number of hands go up in any presentation I'm giving about whether it's better to have a contract or not have a contract. Really? Um, yeah. So it you depends. You cannot have a contract. A lot of people don't have contracts. Huh. I I run into it all the time. In fact, I'm going into a, an arbitration in two weeks uh, over a project that was scheduled to be somewhere around 2.4 million dollars no contract does not seem wise that seems crazy yeah not is there an implicit contract based on the rules of yeah, Austin or Texas I think there's an I mean the parties obviously had some agreement some understanding right the owner expected the contractor to build the facility mm-hmm. the contractor expected the owner to pay for the facility <laughs> everything else in between was sort of up for debate 
But wow. um, incredible. But it, it, it in part explains why we're going to arbitration in two weeks, mm -hmm. right? Um, Boy, that client selection process was not ideal. <laughs> <laughs> well, so some people I had, or maybe they worked together a whole bunch of times. I, no, I that was it. Wasn't that it was it was a client selection problem, and it 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 that one needed management from top to bottom. Uh, but I'll give you an example. There's a subcontract. There's some subcontractors who opinion, and I think they're probably right in some instances. Subs who say that I would be better off without a contract than with a contract. So to give you an example, hmm. when a large general contractor hands a prepared subcontract form to, let's say, concrete sub, what do you think is in that document that's favorable to the subcontractor? Uh, interesting. Very little, uh, right? Yeah. Very little. It's, But the general contractor has to manage the project, and he needs to be able to have certain controls on the when they show up and where they can work and what their claims can be and what type of insurance they have and all the sorts of things that a general contractor has to, is responsible to the owner for. So they have to have some control over what that subcontractor is doing. And the sub, you know, the sub has got the, the experience and wants to do the work and, and but there's nothing in that doc, that subcontract is not written for that sub. There's nothing, very few things in that subcontract that are actually beneficial to the subcontractor itself. So Interesting. I, I have met subcontractors whose um, philosophy was, I, as between signing your standard subcontract agreement versus not having one at all, I'll go without one. So that's a mm -hmm. that's a risk decision for some people. My general rule, though, is it's better to have a contract than not to have a contract. And I've seen situations where there have been very very simple one-page agreements written by one of the parties who's not a lawyer, trying to get down on paper what the party's understanding was. That's better than nothing, but it could be better than what they had. And there's always, the more detail you have, the less room for error there is. My philosophy, and I think I've told you this, Christoph, my philosophy on contracts is I like to use the contract as an agenda for the discussion between the, the two parties. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about these things as an agenda, and here's how I expect the project will go. Yeah talking about schedules, talking about payment, talking about scopes of work. Um, contingencies? Contingencies. Everything that would, you would normally find in what are typically boilerplate contracts, using that as an agenda to walk through and talk about all of them. Well, what about in your example with the subcontractor saying, I'd rather have no contract than that contract, that to me points to the possibility that the contracts are, are odious or, or uh, you know, in that situation odious to the subcontractor. Couldn't we revisit how contracts are written so that both parties are willing to sign them? Well, yeah. I mean, it depends on... Because there's power, right? The GC has more power than the... Right. That's true. And that's that's right. There's always different bargaining strengths um, between these parties. And a lot of times, I'll give you an example, hmm. um, small design firms... Um, maybe mechanical engineers, people like that. Do you know anybody like that? Yeah, I know. <laughs> will sometimes think that they don't have any bargaining power with some large um, institutional owner, a big owner, a big contractor, or a big architectural firm, or something like that. And one of my one of the lawyers in my office is fond of saying, "You don't have any leverage if you don't use it." And if somebody's come to you and they need your specialized knowledge, you have more leverage than you think. Mm -hmm. um, there's always a disparity in bargaining power. Um, large general contractors say that they don't have any bargaining power with the state or the, some big governmental uh, entity, right? And, and, so and these just, institutional owners are large institutional municipal, you know, governmental uh -huh. owners mm -hmm. um, are very uh, reluctant to make changes to a contract. And so you could be the largest general contractor in the world and have a difficult time negotiating a fair contract. Interesting. Most of us would think that a large general contractor would have a lot of bargaining power in most situations, but it depends on who's on the other side. The point is, you got to go through the contract and talk about what, what you can live with and what you can, and that's why I think it's important to go through that contract, especially with relatively unsophisticated people, and talk about what these things say and what they mean. And if you do that, I think you get everybody on the same page and, and usually can have a successful project just by having the meeting. There's a number of things that go into contracting for risk mitigation, 
and some of those are owner driven that owners would want to have in their contracts. Some things are driven by our architect clients, architect and engineer clients that they have their set of things that they want to have in their contract. We have general contractors who have their certain issues with contracts and we have subs and others that have their own issues. So, it, you know, the a discussion about contract negotiation and contract clauses could go on for days because it depends on who the parties are and what they are. Yeah. But usually people have an idea of what, what it is they're looking for. Mm-hmm. And that usually comes from being burned in the past. That's what I was going <laughs> to touch on, actually. And so what, this one-page, simple one-page agreement, someone gets burned and they're like, I'm not doing that again. I'm going to add a page, at least one page, for how I not get burned. One of the fun things I get to do because I write so many contracts is if, we have clients that are long-term, long relationships that we just were with for a long time. It's not one-off, write a contract and never see you again. It's usually a long-term relationship. And so the nice thing about that is year after year, they learn stuff. And they come back to you and say, hey, I would like to change my contract to anticipate this. So Mm -hmm. I don't have to deal with this anymore. Mm -hmm. And solving problems forever instead of solving them, just putting a Band-Aid on them, just solve it forever. So that's nice. That's kind of fun to do. But, yeah, usually, you know, life's the best teacher out there. And (laughs) you get burned a couple of times and somebody starts thinking, how can I make this better? We evolve. Mm -hmm. Well said. So contracts, a short contract spread and no contract, does it imply then that a longer contract is better than a short contract? Not necessarily. Um, I have some very good contracts that I've written for clients that are their standard um, agreements that they use. Um, and it gives them, it's, it's not very long, maybe mm-hmm. a couple of pages that are, of the main terms and conditions that they would want to have in their agreement. That gives them then the flexibility to write the scope of work that they're going to provide. So, Mm -hmm. for instance, an engineering company can write a two-page letter because they're in a better position to describe what it is they're going to do and what they're not going to do and set out the compensation. And then just attach their two- or three-page terms and conditions to the backup. You've seen them. Yeah, you've helped us with that. Ours is literally that. (laughs) Yeah, Mm -hmm. because because I have a number of clients that do that. But but I didn't invent that. I mean, um, you've rented a car from Hertz. Yeah. They've got the same thing. It just happens to be printed on a note card that gets mm-hmm. printed out 482 feet long. Yeah. Um, but that's a standard terms and conditions that they've worked on because they've had a number of issues come Life up. has been the best teacher. So I got a question then. So general contractors probably have an industry association that suggests they use their contract. You and I have met through the AIA Building and Closure Council. The AIA definitely has contracts. How do you advise your clients to navigate on those decisions, like whether you use an AIA contract or their industry, or, or the TAB contract? TAB contracts, Texas yeah. Association of Builders. Yeah. So I will say that it's a lot of times it's driven regionally. Um, here in Austin, um, almost all commercial projects, and even some non-commercial projects, are almost always driven by the AIA. Interesting. So we're very familiar with AIA. I think it is primarily driven by owners uh, and what their owners, what the owners are familiar with, or what their owner, what the owner's lawyer is familiar with. That's usually how they get started. But because it is so prevalent here, most of the contractors are familiar with it too. They've already got their standard revisions to it, so they mm-hmm. don't even have to mm-hmm. hire a lawyer to look at it. Interesting. Um, and the subs are familiar with it too. Although I will say that general contractors and subcontract that agreement, the subcontract agreement is typically not an AIA document. The subcontract agreement is typically written by the general contractor on a general contractor's form. So that's a manuscripted form by the general contractor, and it varies from from contractor to contractor. Um, so there's like this cascading contracts, like the AIA would govern the GC, and then there's a separate set of contracts. Right, right. That Just feed up into... An AIA contract between the owner and the architect, an AIA contract between the owner and the general contractor, a manuscripted contract between the GC and the sub, um, a, probably a purchase order between the sub and a supplier, um, and then between the architect and its sub-consultants, also an AIA form, C401 probably. 
Um, but yeah, the the high level, uh, most of those contracts here in Austin are governed by the AIA. Now, um, there are other documents out there. Uh, the the consensus docs is another version out there. I think in other regions of the country, it's more prevalent than it is here in Texas. Um, some contractors have have tried to suggest using consensus docs. But Could you tell me a little more what that means? So there are other contract forms out there, other uh, other industry forms that are put together by uh, groups like, for instance, the Association Associated General Contractors of America (AGC) mm. put together um, its own set of contract documents called the consensus docs, mm. and I think you have an interesting s- setup where you've got the AIA dominated by architects putting out documents and then you've got AGC dominated by contractors putting out contract documents so which one do you want to use the architect's contract or the contractor's document I want the one that's called consensus right well <laughs> it's well named <laughs> it's um it hasn't gotten a lot of traction here no but that's a serious question that you ask yeah, yeah no I mean it, it, that's uh, I'm sure that marketing had something to do with the naming of that document mm-hmm. uh I've had people ask to use that form. I'm just not familiar enough with it. It's just not used enough for me to... to I, I used to dabble in it, but I don't anymore because it's just not used. But it may be in other parts of the country. I just don't know. Um, you mentioned the TAB forms. Here in Texas, there's the Texas Association of Builders, which represent home builders. Uh, they put together a form. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of that document mm-hmm. um, because I don't think that it... I will say this. It, I think the Texas Association of Builders has, has done a good job in, in um, representing the interests of its members. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure that I've that form that is what I would call fair and balanced. Mm-hmm. I just don't think it ac- – unlike the AGC or the AIA documents, which I think if you pull those off the shelf and use them, for the most part, you're okay. The Texas Association All parties are, for the most part, okay. Which it's mean. close, right? We spend a lot of time messing with it around the fringes and making sure it's project-specific and things like that. Every project has its own unique drivers. The TAB forums, I'm not sure. I wouldn't recommend an owner pull that off the shelf and use that. Mm-hmm. That's, But I'm not here to bash the TAB forums. It's just I think, it, I think people need to spend some time thinking about that if they're going to build a house. Now, that's important, and you're allowed to speak your opinions. Absolutely. Yeah. But I think, again, it's important to have a contract. It's really What's really important about it is not that you have a contract, but that you have a clear understanding of what it is everybody's going to do. Mm-hmm. And I have clients who call and say, I just need you to write a contract so that I never get sued. Well, that's great. If I could do that, I wouldn't be, <laughs> we wouldn't be talking here because <laughs> I would be flying around the world. Uh, the problem is, is that every project is different. Yeah. Even even clients of mine that do the same thing over and over again, every project is different. This time the equity is different. This time the tenants that are moving into the space is different. This time the contractor is different. This time the architect is different. Everything changes. And so it may be a slight tweak to on the payment schedule. It may be a slight tweak on how much contingency we're going to hold back. Um, all of those things get tweaked. And it's just it's important that those things get dealt with you know, sort of in a transparent, upfront way before people will get too invested. Mm-hmm. Interesting, as you were saying that everything changes, what flashed in my head is I'm becoming much more aware about the the um, overlap of the construction and building sciences on the health sciences, how indoor air quality can, can affect the health of occupants. And this is something that the contracts don't really recognize yet. They don't currently have I don't notice uh, things like total VOCs or CO2 content in a contract. No, that's not something that they look at, though I will say that for years the AIA form, at least the owner-architect agreement, has has said things like the architect will evaluate the site mm-hmm. and, and the building materials chosen mm. and will give some... I, I don't have the language. Like suitability for occupancy or they have, something. They do have a suitability. They do have a sustainable projects thing. So you'll that's a separate document where you give give a lot of time spent on what's sustainable. Um, but just in the standard form, they will take time and, and talk about. Um, you know, they don't say it in these words, but the, when, every time I see the language, I think of. Uh, Siting your building and, and dealing with solar gain, 
mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That's kind of what the clause deals with. And But you'll think about the, the, the building material selections and where you're going to site the building. It's just part of it, and I think architects do that. The goal with these contracts, though, like I've said, is is that they get everybody on the same page. And hopefully if it does its job and everybody has spent time reading through it, understands it, and agrees upon it, then the best projects I've ever worked on, they sign the contract and they put it away and never look at it again. Mm-hmm. They sh- shake hands at the end of the project, the last check is cut, and everybody goes on their merry way. Um, sometimes when... Uh, projects start going off the rails and people pull out their contract to start seeing what the other side said they were going to do, that can be a red flag that things have gone off the rails. Mm-hmm. But hopefully they get the contract, they look at it, and they can get themselves back, the on, mm-hmm. back, yeah, back on track and, and follow through with it. So the other, there was a few other things that we talked about. Um, one of those was the project team capabilities. So we had client selection, the contract and your project team capabilities. Again, from a, a study done by an insurance company on on how claims arise, they 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 anticipated that about or they they forecast that about twenty four percent of of claims came from project team capabilities. Again, about a fifth, another fifth. It seems like it's tied a little bit into client selection in terms of. Tied well, into actor selection or something. It can be because one of the they break down this project team capabilities even further, and they identify things like unqualified staff assigned to the project, mm-hmm. or inexperienced project manager, or working on something outside the firm's normal normal type of project or territories. Right. So, yeah, I think client selection and cap- team capabilities go hand in hand. It's, there's two parts of it, though, right? So, and that's, again, coming back to the this white-hot market that we're in, people leave jobs and go other places, and the next thing you know, you're dealing with an inexperienced person doing something that's way beyond their capabilities. Yeah. People taken, have taken work on, that work has to get done, and so now who's going to do it? Yeah. So you end up putting inexperienced people doing things. To your point about the the waterproof uh, detailing guy, how when was the last what was the last project he did? And yeah. And there was no there last was project. One. This is it. So learning on the job. Um, but yeah, those 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 make up for a lot of it. The other thing I think that they throw into that bucket of of claims is, is just not having enough people, just in, just an insufficient number of people, yeah. whether their capabilities are any good or not, just not having enough of them. Mm-hmm. And that's never been more true than it is right now. Yeah, because schedule doesn't slow down just because you don't have as much manpower or person power. Right. I spent a, a fair amount of time uh, dealing with people that are trying to supplement, right, trying to supplement a subcontractor who can't provide enough manpower for the job. But yeah, those those are things, and 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 when people do a lot of projects, and 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 if they're success, successful at those projects, um, then there's a real temptation to start taking on more. Yeah. So the classic case is, especially in the residential world, somebody decides they want to be they're going to build one spec home, and they build one three hundred thousand dollars spec home, and they sell it, and they make a lot of money. The next time they decide to do a five or six hundred thousand dollars spec home, and they that works fine, and they make money on that, then they decide to do two, and so they build two six hundred thousand dollars spec homes, and before you know it, they're building five eight hundred thousand dollars spec homes, and then the music stops. Bad things happen. Yeah. Um, you just told my story for some so I mean, not that high in numbers, but yeah. Did you know that? <laughs> no. About me? Yeah, when I was a builder, that was basically it. The music stopped and I had five spec homes on the ground. Yeah, see? I, Oops. It happens. Uh, wow. And a lot of people are predicting that that will happen here, too. And I assume that at some point the market will slow down because... Mm-hmm. So far as I can tell, trees don't grow to the sky, so I don't know. <laughs> Question is, will it slow down or will it drive off a cliff, right? Will it ease up on the accelerator or just 
or yeah. run into a wall. Or yeah, something. that's what happened in 08, 07, 08. It just that was it. it just ended, mm-hmm. right? Um, as my mentor said, money went to money heaven. Just disappeared, never to return. But um, yeah, so right now it's tough. You've got you've got client selection issues. You got the usual contract issues, and you, then you have the team capability issues. And that's that's really difficult. The team capability stuff can be very difficult because you have to train people. You've got to keep them retained, mm-hmm. um, and you've got to manage workflows. And you got to make sure that there's not more work in the office than than they can handle. Yeah. And that's just easier said than done right now. Yeah. Yeah, that gets into good management, and you know, oftentimes people actually that are technicians, but they're in a management role and. Um, it just go every. It's it, it's interesting. Building science, or you know, any profession is just intimately interconnected in this series of ecosystems with other professions. It all makes a difference. After capabilities, what's next? Communication. I think communication, and and that sort of carries you through the end of a project. Yeah, communication's got to be huge because that's actually like uh, like in an ecosystem like outside here. There's flows of nutrients and there's flows of energy moving around, and that's communication for, for a contract, for a relationship like us. Yeah. This building stuff, building, building a building um, is, a, is a human endeavor. Mm-hmm. It's, so far. So far. Robots right? are probably coming. Probably, but they're still going to be humans. And whether or not, and so you've got a number of workers working on top of each other, being managed by somebody who's a human. and. Some other person's responsible for making sure they get paid. Some yeah. is responsible for making sure they don't get hurt. And insured and under good contracts. And, yeah. There's just a lot of people. And and the successful projects are ones where everybody gets along and sees eye to eye. And uh, I know a lot of owners who want the contractor to make money. And so it doesn't need to be, it, it's not an evil word for yeah. you to make money. On the, I want you to make money on this job because if you're making money on this job, then you'll do well. Do well. Yeah. And that's what I want you to do. I see other projects that are just um, acrimonious from the beginning. Oh, just distrust, and uh, they just never end well. It just makes for a very difficult project. Now, construction is complicated, and construction is stressful, uh, but it can certainly be ramped up with the communication issues. But you know, the communication, you there's only so much you can do in the contract, right? I can you you asked earlier about is it the longer the contract, a, a better contract? Sometimes they are and sometimes they're not. I can't anticipate every scenario in which somebody's going to want to use contingency money. Mm-hmm. I, the best I can do is try to identify the most common ways people are going to try to use contingency and then explain whether or not you can use contingency money for that scenario. But I can't think of everything because if I did, the contract would be 2,000 pages long. Yeah. So there's got to be some level of communication. And when somebody says, I'd like to use contingency for this, there needs to be an understanding that we, we, we all get each other. We understand why you're doing that and how that's going to ultimately affect the, the success of the project. Yeah. And if nobody has to pull out the contract, then they're better off for it. But, um, but you know, value engineering decisions, contingency use... Um, change orders, things like that. Those those are all communication driven things. Did the architect communicate well how it intended that detail to be constructed? Mm-hmm. If not, the contractor needs to communicate back to the architect and the owner that he's confused about that. And then those three parties need to get together and communicate on what is intended. And then that general contractor needs to communicate that to the sub so that he can communicate that to his four person and that four person can communicate it to the guys who are actually going to do it. Yeah. And so many problems get so many problems arise from the inability to communicate what's on the plans to the guy in the field actually doing the work. Yeah. yeah. And so there's a number of different elements of this communication business. Um, but I think everybody listening knows that it's the guys in the field doing the work yeah. that matter. The hands that do the work ultimately matter. Yeah. If you want a successful project and it, it not to leak or or have other defects in it, it's going to be the guys actually doing the work. Um, I had a, um, a a friend of mine who was talking to an industry trade group guy, represents a lot of this, this trade group is a, a contractor driven organization and he was asking the guy whether or not he spent any time on recruiting and quite frankly I was a little confused by what he meant by recruiting but what he meant was how much 
money do you spend out of your your budget to go talk to kids in high school about going into the construction business? And the guy he was talking to said he spent zero dollars hmm. on that. And so what we have is we've got a, a, a situation where people are told that they need to go to college, and so they go to college, and so that just sort of doubles down on our labor shortage. Yeah. And and there's not people in the industry that are sort of lifelong. You know, everybody wants to be at the top, and nobody wants to be at the bottom. So you have that situation. So yeah. you just have people that are not experienced at doing something that they shouldn't probably be doing. Mm-hmm. That's a big societal issue currently. The, yeah. the societal view of, that, of trades generally, and in Europe it's different. There's there's still guilds, and there's still a lot of. You know, it, it's a very respectful role in society. It's interesting you were talking about um, the hands that do the work and ultimately they have to be successful. And I was thinking about it from the engineering perspective and it just clicked to me how powerful actually the architect is because the hands that do the work, the enclosure designer or the enclosure design and the mechanical design, we can compensate for challenging architectural designs in terms of massing, orientation and aperture, but we can't fix it all. So it's interesting, the architect... You know, like uh, something like a butterfly roof, or you know, it, you know, well, gravity is done relenting, and at some point the power sticky might fail, and you've you've designed it with that roof. So um, all your trades are kind of um, in terms of client selection, actually. So I could look at a project with a butterfly roof as an installing contractor for, like, say, a roof, and be like, uh, I'm going to choose another client. Right. Yeah, so the archi- you architects listening, man, you guys are the in the driver's seat in a lot of ways early on. I had a conversation with a guy, this actually a, a same guy, uh, about the power of architects um, along the same lines. And I, so hmm. let me back up. What, when we were talking about communication, one of the things I was going to mention is this is this this lack of communication and getting everybody on the same page is, is something that's very common, and, and the industry is aware of it. And one of the things that the industry's tried to do is is certain things like integrated project. Delivery, yeah, right? We've talked about to this get a people lot. together and, and focus on these things and get those kinks worked out early on. Um, but that's a that's a communication driven thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so that means the contractor would tell the architect, you know, that gravity is never turning off, and you're directing the rainwater toward the center of your structure. Yeah, and for those guys to get on the same page about how how is this going to work and yeah. what you know can we do it, it this work. way. Yeah. Um, but um, but yeah, I think that that. The, under the traditional delivery approach, um, architects do have some uh, some some leverage in that regard. And so uh, I have a lot of architect clients who feel I have no leverage whatsoever. But owners, yeah. I will tell you, it's a difference of perception. And owners believe that architects have an uh, incredible amount of leverage over the project. And it makes owners uncomfortable to think about how much leverage an architect has. So um, Interesting. But it goes back to this this notion of embracing risk, and so many people want to offload risk onto somebody else. And when you offload risk, you things can happen. Yeah, that'll strain a relationship. Yeah, right. I've got a uh, a client that's working on a project right now where the contractor is a very very good contractor, but they are very risk averse. And so, any time that what the owner needs of them right now is is creativity. Help me figure out a way to do this very high-end project this, that, that I can do cost-effectively. Help me. You tell me. You help me. Mm-hmm. And the contractor is, is very reluctant mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. do that because I, feel, I think that they feel like it's a little bit outside of their, their bailiwick. Mm-hmm. They're used to very Give me the plan, defined, yes, and, and that is asking them to do something they don't feel comfortable doing. They'll ha- they're happy to do it, but they're risk-averse about it, and so they'll only do it if certain conditions are met about insurance or certain things are covered, and it's stymieing the relationship. Wow. So it's, it's, a, you know, it's a people business. Yeah, yeah. So these, these nodes of, of the resource exchange I'm talking about in this ecosystem one of the resources is risk. One of you know, there's economics, there's risk, and we have a static equilibrium in some sense, or quasi-static equilibrium, where we have this known system of producing buildings this way. And as soon as you say, "Let's do it better," 
What you're also asking for is let's reconfigure this stat semi-static system. Whew. Right. Step out of this, and you may be taking on more risk, but you may not, but you don't know. It's yeah. the unknown. It's the known unknown. Mm -hmm. So with rec communication there, staying on that for a minute, are there recommendations, specific recommendations you can make you know, as an attorney? I'll just be a little honest with you here, right? There's certain times where someone will send me an email, and I, I want to reply a certain way to them, and I realize... I don't want to reply this way, and I don't mean anything illegal, but I want to call them, and I want to air it out person to person and then have a more measured response. Is it sometimes better to do it in writing? or? Yeah, that question comes up all the time. Um, I've got a suspicion, and one of these days I'm going to have somebody plot these numbers. I've got a suspicion that the number of claims is inversely correlated to how much people actually talk. And so, at the end of the day, I think email is going to bring down society. <laughs> that will be the downfall because we don't talk anymore. We send emails. Yeah, exactly. And there's so much misunderstanding in that. But, um, no, I think that there are – and back to something that was talked about earlier, you live and learn, right? And so I have uh, clients who will fire off a very angry email. But before they actually hit send on it, they send it to me. And, and then we work through it and make sure that it doesn't – go out before somebody else has put eyes on it. Mm -hmm. Because we've all done it. We've all said something in an email that we regret later. And, or in some cases, people have said things in an email that they may not have even, even regretted the day after, but they regretted it 18 months later when they were in an arbitration proceeding and it got put up on the screen in front of the arbitrators. Ooh. Uh, and I've seen that happen a lot. So, you know, I'm a big proponent of picking up the phone and talking. And mm -hmm. I do that with my with opposing counsel, in my case. It's much easier just to pick up the phone and talk with that person because you get so much more out of it than you do in an email. And yeah. once we've gotten an understanding, they've heard what I'm trying, the message I'm trying to convey, and that I'm not trying to be um, overbearing, that this is I'm trying to solve a problem, and this is how I think we can solve a problem. It'll be very simple. I'm going to send you an email now that's going to basically outline that, as opposed to sending that email and saying, this is how we're going to solve this problem. Yeah, exactly. And then, well, what if I don't want to? So that's... You know, that's my, I, I always def default to picking up the phone and calling somebody. But there are some situations where you have conversations with people, and despite everybody having a warm fuzzy about that conversation, it never goes the way you think afterwards. Mm. And so those need to be papered up after the fact, right? We just had a conversation, and you said you were going to do X, and I'm going to do Y. I'm going to send you an email now. That's going to confirm that, and I'm going to ask you to agree that that's what we talked about. And that way there's no misunderstanding. We had a nice, friendly conversation on the phone. We're both on the same page. I've just put that down in writing. You've now confirmed it. And so if there's ever a misunderstanding later on, we can both go back and look at it. Mm -hmm. And and that happens That happens a lot. That happens in construction every day. That happens in law practice every day. All right, so we're getting near the end here. Let's do a quick wrap-up. So it's interesting. You talked about the four C's, client selection. Right. So that's obviously very important. Check check out what you're getting into. Be careful. Be mindful of the market that you're in because there's going to be kind of unseen forces there, pressures to move you into situations. Um, contracts. Yep. That seems to me where the rubber might meet the road in a lot of ways. Um I have a specific question on that as we do this wrap up. <laughs> um, I'm sometimes loath to read every word on a contract. Um, Most and, of my clients are. And yet I, I recognize how important those words are. So what I do is I have a relationship that I trust. I mean, and I'm looking you in the eye right now, and then, you know, there you go. So I say, Joe, is this, is this the right contract for me? And, um, and look, as an attorney, what's your advice on that? Always have an attorney. Um, I think it's important to do that. I, I think I've had clients who get very nervous about engaging a lawyer because they've, ne they've never done that before, and they think it will be wildly expensive, and they don't want to get yeah. hurt, right? So I understand that. But like a lot of different industries, um, hiring a lawyer has got a sort of a pr fairly predictable curve. It's just if we're talking about sort of what I refer to as outside general counsel, as opposed to I've got a piece of litigation or I've got this dispute going, that's a separate animal. But just outside general counsel, somebody I can pick up the phone and call, as opposed to the lawyer I've hired to work in the office next to me. Um, 
what I tell clients is that there's a predictable curve on that and there's going to be a ramp up of that. It won't be phenomenally, it's not, it's, I wouldn't say it's that expensive. But the cost. What's the ramp up on? What are the well, axes on the curve actually? What are we ramping up? Cost just to have over time, of time and cost, right? Okay. So the initial, there's going to be some time for the lawyer to get up to speed to understand mm-hmm. what Understanding. it is you do, yeah. look at your contract and understand what the risk issues there are right. and get that cleared up. Once, once that's done, though, I have clients that have been clients of mine for more than 10 years, 15 or 20 years. The cost, that transaction cost, though, even for very long, very complicated, very large projects, that transaction cost is not very high at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and in some cases, maybe less than $2,000 a month. Mm-hmm. And we're talking about $100 million contracts that we're looking at. Mm-hmm. Because I understand their business so well, I understand what their risk profile is, I understand what their insurance program is, I understand... Because I've done looked at so many of their contracts, I know what they can comply with, and I know what creates an issue. And so I can issue spot that very quickly, point that out to my operations manager, who is very competent as well, makes my job easier. And then I just send them my thoughts, and then he handles it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have other clients who are less sophisticated than them, and it's it's but it's it's the the curve is the same. It takes a little while to ramp up. But I have a client who, just like you, Christoph, who says, I'm not going to look at this contract. <laughs> and so he sends them all to me. And I'll look at all those contracts and get them back to him. Um, and I told him after the first year that he was a client of mine, um, I'd looked at how much I'd billed him for the total for the year. And I said, it was less than you hiring a receptionist in your office. So for the price of hiring somebody to answer your telephones, you have somebody who was looking at your contracts instead of you looking at the contract. Now, it's a two-way street, or it's not really a two-way street. It's a, it takes two to tango is yeah. the issue. I need you to tell me what the issues are because until I understand your business as well as you do, yeah. I can't do your part. Mm-hmm. Once I do learn your business as well as you do, then I don't need you as much. Right. But, yeah, I think that everybody should have an advisor that they can send stuff to because we're busy. Mm-hmm. And your highest and best... I'll give you a perfect example. Lawyers are not supposed to ask questions that they don't know the answer to, but do you mow your own grass? I do. Yeah, I knew that was coming. I knew it. Well, if you had said no, I would say that's because your highest and best use is not mowing the grass. <laughs> oh, no, my front yard's about as big as your I office know, here. It takes gonna... me a few minutes. <laughs> but, my, but, but it works the same for your car. It yeah, works the same it. for your stuff. You, you want the person, you want to, I don't mow my own grass anymore, though I kind of enjoy doing it. Uh, but that's because the guy that's mowing my grass is better at that than I am, mm-hmm. and I can be doing other stuff. Yeah. It frees up my time. And there's a number of people that want to review their own contracts. I have a lot of clients that do that. That's fine. But sometimes when you get into one and you're either real busy or you don't understand what it mm-hmm. is, I, it's, I think, hugely important and hugely valuable to have somebody that you trust that understands your business looking at those things for you. And I yeah. don't think it's expensive. And nothing's ever been more true than, than an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure in this instance. Yeah. Okay. So contracts. Read them or trust somebody to read them. Yeah. And then you have capabilities of the team. That varies over time. Communication is so important. Right. That, that makes so much sense. And I guess where this conversation started, we're thinking about it from the building science perspective, this system of systems that is people... These contracts, they are like the unseen force that is always on. You know, it's kind of like a gravity in some sense. It's an unseen driving force because we're all risk averse. We want to make some money. We want to do good work. It's profound what you do, and yet yeah, no one really pays attention to you until they need you. They don't. They <laughs> don't want to. They don't like it. They don't like looking at them. They don't like thinking about it. They don't even like talking to me They because they feel like... Look, I get involved in the front end of these projects. That must and so be irritating. Or, or, it know, takes a while to painful to, to get a relationship going. But you know, you're so many lawyers. I think are trying to keep things from happening, right? Mostly bad things. I don't want bad things to happen. But I think a lot of people view lawyers as preventing the project from happening mm-hmm. or making it more difficult to get the project or going. Or predatory a little bit. Like, yeah, as long I think as I can keep billing hours. That's right. I don't care what happens. That's right. Then it, listen, that happens. But no, you can't say that. It does. It That's happens. cynical, Joe. But <laughs> it happens. I have clients who come in that way, but they then they quickly realize I'm not going to stop the project, right? I'm not going to keep you from having a deal. 
So it's better to get those deal points out. You were talking about some things that, you know, every project's different. You may have some concerns. You want to make money. You don't want to take on risk. I encourage people to put those the, the, their concerns right into the contract. Write them in plain English. Just put them right in. <laughs> and, and then even if that doesn't end up being the final version of the contract, at least your counterpart saw what your concerns were. Mm-hmm. Right, that language may get tweaked, or it may be dealt with somewhere else, or maybe stricken altogether. But at least you've gotten a chance to tell the client, "Listen, my concern is that mm-hmm. I do this, and then somebody, your contractor comes along and decides it can be done cheaper a different way, and so you don't do what I've said. And so my concern is that you get mad at me at the end of the project because it doesn't perform like I told you it would. But it's not because you didn't; it's because you didn't follow my design. You let somebody else change it. Right. Write that right in. If you change my design, then I'm not going to be responsible for your level of comfort or your operating costs. Right. Those sorts of things. And it doesn't, that's two words. Just write it right in. And that's communication. Yeah. And I yeah. think most people, you know, sometimes it, it does happen where people just come to loggerheads. They're just never going to agree on something. That's fine. But that's a rare, I think that's rare. Mm-hmm. Most of the time it's, I understand what you're saying. I think we can work around that. And you get it massaged and you move on. Yeah. The, uh, the best analogy I have for that is um, I went to Texas A&M for undergraduate, and Texas A&M's got a world-famous, nationally famous marching band. Hmm. They had a program, to a computer program, to come up with the formations for the band. Really? To walk and you know to do the march and everything. And I was told that the program uh, couldn't do certain things because, you know, if you've ever seen the A&M band, they've got the tubas walking in the back, and the tubas... Got their big tuba bell mm-hmm. in the back. And the computer couldn't make the formations as tight as the director wanted them to because the tubas. But the program couldn't anticipate the fact that the tuba players could turn their shoulders when they walked past somebody else. And so uh, if you've ever watched the marching band, the tubas turn their shoulders yeah. and they walk past people. Uh-huh. But the computer program couldn't account for that. But so how does this relate to what we were talking about? The human beings can. <laughs> Humans can figure out a way, uh-huh. right? They just deal with it. You deal with it in real time. That's so. great. That 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 is probably a decent place to end this. In terms of a, here we have an attorney saying, "I have complete trust in the power of humans." <laughs> oh well, uh. humanity. Oh, he didn't. He didn't say that. <laughs> Do you have any final thoughts, Joe? No, I don't have any final thoughts. Well, thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Enjoy it. And thank you all for listening. We'll be back next time.